Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So uh, my talk tonight is tools and techniques for tracking down RFI. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is kind of a, a, a somewhat sideways adaption of some of the stuff that I figured out for the QST article I wrote in April 2016 about uh, solar power. Um, but it's also uh, based on a lot of my own personal experience over uh, 35 years of living in this location. Uh, I am trying to make, there we go. So uh, here's some of my background. Uh, I was licensed in 1967 when I was 14 years old. I had a 35 year career as a double E in biomedical ultrasound with Hewlett Packard, Agilent and Phillips. Um, my uh, college background is physics and ocean engineering. I took one circuit theory course, pass fail, and all the rest of my double E knowledge was uh, ham radio and on the job training. I've lived in this location for uh, over 30 years. Um, and I've been uh, active on the air since uh, 1987. I've got two towers right now. I've got a 78 footer in the backyard and a 50 foot, which is uh, bracketed against the end of the house. Uh, most of my operation is uh, HF. Um, I only uh, use VHF for uh, communicating with the town emergency uh, management group. Uh, so uh, most of my experience is on HF. Um, I am principally a contester. Uh, I was president of Yankee Clipper Contest Club for about six years. Um, and uh, I've been into contesting for uh, since probably the early 90s. Uh, also DXing, you know, and a little bit of weak signal work. Uh, not into the digital modes uh, uh, so much. And uh, I live within an eighth of a mile of a 110 kV substation. And the 110 kV distribution lines actually uh, have an easement on my property. Um, so they don't go exactly right over my property, but they're probably within 100 feet of my station antennas. So what I'm going to uh, cover tonight is uh, what is RFI? We'll make a, give you a definition. Um, so you have a problem, uh, get your own house in order, correlate and localize. I'll talk about some tools and some techniques we can use for resolutions. Um, so in terms of RFI, what is it? We'll talk about the, the definition, sources, paths, and remediation. So my definition of RFI is RF currents from a source propagate via a path to a susceptible device causing an undesired response. So examples of sources are switching supplies, arcing power lines, digital circuitry, and, and yes, even your ham transmitter can be a source. And the paths are either radiated uh, through radio waves or conducted along cables and wires. And susceptible devices includes radios, TVs, hi-fi systems, arc fault breakers in your house wiring, and you know the list goes on. I, th I think uh, principally the concern tonight is uh, some other source getting into your ham radio uh, and interfering with your ability to communicate. And we'll talk about remediation. And typically, the, the way you can remediate it, there's three ways. You can eliminate or reduce the uh, energy coming out of the source. You can modify the design of the equipment to add filtering. Or maybe you can change the frequency that the equipment operates at. Or you can add effective shielding. You can also remediate it by eliminating or reducing the path. So you can add shielding or you can add filtering to, the, to any conductors. And then you can also filter it at the susceptible device. So if the, if the place where the interference is causing trouble is your ham radio, there's not much you can do about that because 
by the time it gets to your radio, it's on frequency. It's on the frequency that you're trying to listen to. And so there's no way you can filter that without filtering out what you're actually trying to hear. And so in that situation, you're limited to the first two options. You can't really do much about filtering it at the radio. The exception to that would be if, if the energy coming in is so strong, if it's coming in on a, on a, not on the frequency you're trying to operate at, but it's overloading the radio. And on, under those conditions, you can use a filter at your radio to reduce the level so it's not overloading the radio. So you have a problem. You sit down to the rig and instead of hearing your fellow hams, you hear this horrible buzzing noise or some other kind of nasty noise. Uh, the first thing you wanna do is try to identify as much as you can the source by its sound. Um, and there are websites, I'm sorry, I don't have pointers to them or links, but I think the league probably has one and there are other sites where you can go and listen to different types of noise and it tells you what, what made that noise. Um, one key factor is whether it, it repeats across the band. So you may notice a big spike at one frequency and if you have a uh, a spectrum on your radio, or if you tune around, you may hear the noise repeating periodically up and down the band. Um, and that's, that's a tip off to what its source might be. Does it have a 60 Hertz component? Um, and so if you hear a buzzing noise and it has a 60 Hertz component, that's a pretty good indication that it's probably caused by power lines. Um, and you can figure out if it's a 60 Hertz component in a number of ways. You can just take the audio out of your radio, put it on a scope if you have a scope, trigger the scope on the line frequency. And if the noise is stationary under that condition, then it's synchronous with, a, with the line frequency and you know it's likely to be a power line issue. Does it come and go or is it always there? Uh, does it come on at night? Does it pulsate? Um, does it, is it there on weekends? Um, and also, does it depend on the weather? So uh, typically power line noise, depending on what part of the power line it is, can be the only present in dry, windy weather, or it could be only present in, in wet, rainy weather. But if it is weather dependent, then that's, that's a tip off if nothing else, it tells you that the, the noise source is outdoors, um, uh, not, not in a building or not associated with some kind of a machine or, or power supply. So the first thing to do if you experience noise is to get your own house in order. What, what I mean by that is you want to figure out if the source of the noise is in your house. Um, and it's very likely that it is. If, if you hear a noise and it's typical of some kind of a switching power supply, it could be any of dozens and dozens of wall warts and power supplies that are plugged into your house. Um, almost all of us have all kinds of these nasty little wall warts. In the good old days, they were kind of heavy because they actually had a transformer in them. And those were linear supplies and those didn't make a lot of noise. But nowadays they're not very heavy at all and they have some kind of a mean little switcher in them and they can make a lot of noise. Um, and the thing is that your house is probably full of them whether you, whether you intended it to be or not. So basically what you wanna do is set up your, your, your radio so that it is battery powered if you can. Um, or, or if you can't make your ham radio battery powered, then use a battery powered radio. And I'll talk about that a, a little bit later. But listen to the RFI. And while that's going on, kill the main breaker to your house. And of course, before you kill the main breaker to the house, you wanna make sure that everybody who has a computer in the house knows that you're gonna kill the main breaker. You don't wanna irritate everybody. Um, but at that point, uh, if the noise continues, then it's not in your house and you, you've already kind of 
change the, the uh, territory that you're going to have to go and do the hunting in. If the noise stops, then turn off all the branch breakers and turn on the main breaker and then turn on the branch circuits one at a time until the noise returns. And that'll help hopefully get you down to knowing which room in your house uh, the noise source is in. And then at that point, you can go to the room and start unplugging stuff and hopefully uh, track it down that way. Uh, a lot of times the noise source will be in your house. Um, it'll be something new that you just bought, um, some uh, new appliance or something like that. I got a few war stories at the end that I can tell you about. So if, if it's not in your house, then you're gonna have to go on an RFI hunt. And by far the biggest difficulty in doing this is uh, correlating what you hear on your ham radio with what you can hear on a portable receiver. So if you're gonna walk around or drive around and try to find a noise source, you're gonna need a portable receiver to, uh, to find it. And it's probably gonna be some kind of a battery powered shortwave receiver. And the thing is that your ham radio, probably you have a, a dipole or a, a beam antenna. And so you have really good sensitivity and it's very sensitive to this noise. And when you start going around with a portable radio with some kind of a small antenna, it's not nearly as sensitive as your station radio is. And so oftentimes you'll hear a nasty noise. It'll be S7 or S9 on the ham station, and you'll just barely be able to hear it, if at all, on a, on a portable with a short antenna. So one, the first thing you have to do is try to correlate and make sure that what you're hearing on the transistor radio is the same thing that you're hearing on the station receiver. Then if you happen to have a rotary beam, uh, you can use that to at least figure out a direction that the noise is coming from. And a tip for that is if you have a beam, it probably has uh, a main lobe, which is fairly broad. And so the noise will only vary a couple of dB, which is a lot less than a S unit, as you move the antenna back and forth across this direction of the noise. But your antennas your, typically have a sharp null. And if you can figure out where the null is, you can use the null and that's a much, uh, much better, uh, much more sensitive direction indicator. And if you can get some help from another ham in town, um, then you guys could work out a, a, a triangulation if you can both hear the same noise and you can, that'll help you locate the, uh, the source. And uh, so oftentimes if you start to go out and, and do your RFI hunting, uh, you may just have to find the noise source by the strength of the noise instead of by uh, the direction of it. Uh, and uh, another thing is that with, if you have noise on a low frequency band, and let's, just, let's assume for a moment that it's power line noise, it can follow the power lines and uh, it can be very difficult to really triangulate on that kind of noise, unless you happen to get lucky and get near the pole or the particular location where the noise is coming from. So we'll talk about some of the tools that are helpful to use. Um, one of them is a portable shortwave uh, radio. And the one that I recommend is the Sony ICF 2010. I don't know if they still make them, but they're still available on eBay and they actually are fairly expensive even on eBay, but they're definitely worth it uh, as long as they're in good working condition. So this particular radio um, covers uh, everything, you know, covers uh, short waves and bands and also up to the aircraft band, which is where, is that that's an important thing that you want. And we'll talk about that later, but it's basically a battery powered radio. So you can carry it around with you as you walk around. It has an internal uh, ferrite antenna, a typical uh, loop antenna. It has a whip antenna. 
It also has an external antenna jack that you can use to plug in uh, a, another antenna and that will disable the internal antenna. Uh, and one very important thing is that it has uh, the aircraft band. And what's good about the aircraft band, that's about 130 megahertz and it's AM. And being an AM detector, it's really good at hearing noise. And uh, being on the aircraft band, you can build a small Yagi antenna and that'll give you some good directionality if you're walking around and hunting for an arcing power line or something like that. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, you can also use a uh, QRP ham rig. And this has the advantage that it's uh, very sensitive. Uh, and it probably has better sensitivity than the Sony uh, rig. Um, the disadvantage is that it, it uh, typically doesn't cover the, uh, the aircraft band with uh, an AM detector, but uh, this would work as well. So now we'll talk about some of the uh, antennas that you might use. So one of the basic tools is a shielded magnetic loop antenna. This is a uh, very small, it's just like the antennas that you see in the uh, World War II movies where they're trying to find the spy with a radio and uh, it is a shielded magnetic loop, which means it, it doesn't pick up uh, uh, just general static uh, as much. Um, and it basically has this figure eight pattern uh, that you can see over here. Can you see my cursor? Uh, I'm not hearing anybody, but I hope you can see the cursor. Anyway, it has a very sharp null uh, in the, uh, basically in the direction of the loop. And you can use that null very easily for locating a, a source. And then uh, another useful tool is a small shielded loop. Um, this is one that was designed by Chuck W1HIS, who has done a lot of work with RFI and a lot of study of ferrites and stuff. And uh, basically you take the a piece of cardboard off the back of a, a pad of paper and you get some small RG174 coax and you build this little shielded magnetic loop. And uh, this is shown in the picture of this radio here. You can see what this looks like. It's basically a piece of cardboard with a loop uh, of coax and you can use a, a ruler or something to give it kind of a, a handle and you plug the coax into the, into the uh, transistor radio. And this is very useful for locating sources in your house. If you discover with the breaker test that you do have a, a source in your house, you can walk around the house and locate it with this. You can also locate out outdoor sources as well. And then uh, one other tool is a, uh, a small Yagi antenna for uh, 130 megahertz. And it's just a typical Yagi. And the thing is that at this frequency, it's very small and, and uh, easy to handhold. And you can, uh, there's very good directivity. You can find localized things very easily. You can point it up at a power pole or you can stand in the street and point it at you know, three poles in a row and figure out which one it is. The, the trick here is that you're hoping that the noise you hear at 130 megahertz is correlated with the, with the actual noise source that's bothering you on your ham station. There have been many, many times when I've been out walking around with this thing and I thought I had narrowed down a noise source and it turns out it's, it's not the noise source that's bothering me. So that can be kind of, a, kind of a, an issue. Now, just in case you think I'm all talk, I'm gonna stop sharing. And I've, I've got a, a few of these tools here that I can talk about. So this is the, uh, the magnetic loop antenna. And in this case, I've got the uh, tuning capacitor inside a, an aluminum box. And this is just a regular BNC cable, standard BNCs on both ends. And I've cut the shield here at the top. You can't see it, it's underneath this piece of tape. So by cutting the shield, that makes it so that the inner conductor is your, is your antenna, but it's shielded 
so it's not picking up static. And you can just basically walk around, you can turn it like this. And basically this is gonna uh, have a null in, in the direction of a loop. So when the loop is pointing at the noise source, you'll hear a null. And I also have the uh, 130 megahertz Yagi. Uh, this is one that I built, I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago. And it's uh, just made out of a stick of wood and a bunch of uh, aluminum from, I don't know where I got the aluminum from. It's got a little gamma match on it, the matching capacitor. It has a, uh, a choke ballon on it and a piece of coax going to uh, a box. And what's in the box is uh, a Radio Shack aircraft band radio. And it's, it's a real shame that Radio Shack is out of business because this radio was just perfect for hunting RFI with this, with this beam antenna. Um, it had an AM detector at about 130 megahertz and it fit inside an aluminum box. You wanna put it, in this case, you, I had to put it in the aluminum box because this radio had a loop antenna, had a ferrite you know, bar antenna that I couldn't disconnect. So in order to make sure I was only hearing signals from the beam, I had to put it in a metal box and connect the antenna in through, through a BNC. So there's a, a couple of the, of the tools that I have here. Let me see if I can go back to sharing again. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, so, uh, Next thing we'll talk about is uh, resolutions. And I'm going to kind of jump into uh, the uh, concept here of switching power supplies. And I'm going to talk about them a little bit uh, in, in depth, because if it's not uh, a power line that's giving you trouble, most likely it's a switching power supply. Um, and uh, if you have a neighbor or maybe even on your own house if you have uh, solar uh, power generation like I do, uh, that's all full of switching power supplies. And uh, so that's uh, a, a situation you're gonna have to address if that's causing interference to your ham station. So basically I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how switchers work. Basically a DC power source is switched on and off by a saturated switch. And a saturated switch is one that's either completely open or uh, has it's on completely and it has very low on resistance. Um, voltage is converted by a transformer or an inductor to a desired output voltage. And uh, the thing is that higher switching frequencies mean that all of the parts in the uh, switcher can be smaller. So if the switcher operates at a lower frequency, the inductors and the capacitors and it all have to be larger. But if it works at a higher frequency, they can all be smaller. And the output of it can be, uh, of this transformer can be rectified uh, or filtered. And uh, they're cheap, they're very efficient, but they're deadly for ham radio. So basically switchers operate by, uh, chopping a DC supply voltage. And that, that means they're taking DC and they're making it into a square wave. And if you study a square wave, you'll see that it contains uh, many, many harmonics and they, they don't fall off very fast. So here's a plot um, and it's basically the, the fundamental frequency is one kilohertz and you've got all the odd harmonics. So you've got three, five, seven, all the way up. And you'll see that, that up here at 21, uh, the 21st harmonic, it's only down uh, you know, less than 30 dB. So that's, that's not coming down very quickly. Um, and I, I had a case where um, a, uh, there was a, a woman with a, uh, a solar power array and it was interfering with her AM radio reception. And the switcher was operating at 18 kilohertz. 
and it was wiping out a station at uh, uh, one megahertz. It was uh, WBZ 1030. And so it was some incredibly high harmonic of the switching frequency itself that was actually doing the, the damage. So now we'll talk a little bit about um, controlling the RF from switchers. Basically, a switcher can be just considered as a four terminal device with two input connections and two output connections. So if it's a wall wart, the input is the 120 volts AC and the output is whatever the rectified output voltage, maybe it's five volts for a USB charger or something like that. The RF is generated internally and it can be conducted out of the device through either set of terminals. The energy can come out the uh, AC side, power line side, or it could come out the uh, USB side. And reasonable engineering practice includes putting a capacitor across the input and output terminals. And there may also be some small capacitance between the internal ground of the device and any external ground. And because of all of this, what this means is that the RF that comes out of switchers is primarily common mode uh, on the input or output connections. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. So here's a picture of a switcher. Basically, you've got some kind of a switch, hence the name, that is chopping a, uh, an input voltage. And that's applied to a transformer or an inductor. And then the result uh, is a different voltage closer to what you want and it's rectified and it comes out on the other side. And so good engineering practice says that you would put a, put a capacitor here and put a capacitor here. And whether you intend it or not, there's gonna be some capacitance between the device's ground and uh, the case of the device. <coughs> and this might only be, you know, a, a small number of peak affairs, um, but it's always there. So this architecture basically means that any RF that's coming out of this thing is very likely to be common mode. And so now I'll explain what common mode is and what differential mode is. Common mode means that the, the interfering signal is coming out in phase on all the conductors. So if it current is flowing to the right on one of the conductors, it's flowing to the right on all of the conductors. Differential mode uh, means the opposite. It means that uh, current is flowing in one direction on one conductor and in the other direction on the other, uh, other conductor. <coughs> your, your transmission line, whether it's ladder line or coax, operates in differential mode. So the uh, signal, if it's, if it's ladder line, the balance line, the RF is theoretically balanced equal and opposite on the two conductors. If it's coax, it's balanced on the center conductor and on the inside of the shield. The common mode just means that all of the wires in the cable all act like an antenna together. And depending on what kind of mode uh, dictates what kind of remediation you have to do. So common mode, we would want to introduce some kind of an impedance in all the conductors of a cable. And the easiest way to do that is to add a ferrite bead over the cable. <coughs> Adding a ferrite bead does not eliminate differential mode. So your switcher could be generating differential mode as well. And if you put a ferrite bead on it, that's not going to do anything for it. For differential mode noise, you have to introduce an impedance in each individual conductor and possibly have a bypass capacitor to ground. And, and by doing that, uh, you can get rid of the differential mode uh, energy. And the bottom line is you may need both. You may have to do both. So here's an example of a common mode choke. And this is uh, one of the chokes that I built uh, for my solar array. And this one is using uh, solar connectors and, and the very uh, stiff and large number 10 gauge wire that they use for wiring solar arrays. 
but it's three turns of both conductors through this core. Um, and this core is a, a large uh, ferrite core. And basically we're trying to introduce an impedance into all the conductors of the cable. And in order to make a effective common mode choke, you have to be concerned, you have to pick the right core material for the frequency that you're trying to attenuate. And you have to have the right number of turns. Um, and typically more is better, but not always. So when you're going to pick a core material uh, or a particular core, uh, you can look up on the web with the vendor and you should find a graph like these. So here are a couple of typical ferrite uh, cores. And these are both from the ferrite corporation. So if you were to just Google these numbers, you'd probably find a link to the ferrite page and you'd be able to find these, these charts. And what these charts are telling you is the uh, resistance, the in inductive reactance, and the total impedance for one turn through that core. Sometimes the charts will include two turns or three turns, but they always include one turn. And what you're interested in is to have the um, total impedance be high in the frequency of interest. So this core here is, it's mix 75. These, these two numbers in the, the Part, uh, part number tell you the mix. And this is very effective at 1.8 megahertz. <clears throat> so if you've got noise that's interfering with your 160 meter operation, this would be the one. This one peaks right, right on 160 meters. And then this one over here is a different core and this is using mix 31, which is a good all around mix for HF. And so you see this one is, uh, so let me see, that's a megahertz, that's 10 megahertz, that's 100 megahertz. So um, your overall impedance is peaking, you know, it's rising in the HF range and it's peaking at uh, VHF. So typical uh, rule of thumb is for low frequency, use mix 75 or 77. 77 is an older mix and, and it's typically available in a lot of different forms. 75 is a newer mix. Uh, it's more expensive, but as you saw, it's really good for 160. For general HF, uh, recommend mix 31 or 43 uh, from uh, ferrite. These are all ferrite numbers. And for VHF and up, use mix 61. Uh, and those should pretty well cover uh, anything that you, uh, you need. So these show uh, some of the shape factors uh, that you can get the material in. Uh, this one here on the left is your basic 2.4 inch uh, OD core. That's very useful. If you get those in mix 31, they're, they're very, very effective. You, very large, you can get uh, pass a PL259 through it. Um, or a power plug, you know, a 110 volt plug. You can get the, a, a plug through it and get uh, at least five or, or, or more turns on it. This one here is a little smaller. You couldn't get a, a PL259 through there, uh, but if you ran, you could run any kind of coax like uh, 59 or 213 and then put the PL259 on it afterwards uh, and that would be effective. This is a snap-on core. So this core has been split and it's been polished along the split surfaces so that it can be put back together again and have a minimal air gap between the two pieces. And it has a plastic housing that snaps together. In general, a solid core is always better than a split core because every split core has some little air gap in it and that's gonna reduce the inductance and impedance that you can get. So it's always better to use a solid core if you can. And the other thing is never, never trust the plastic clip of these things because over time they will creep and they'll open up. And as soon as you get a significant air gap between the two pieces, 
it's completely useless. So if you have to use these because maybe you can't take the connector off, um, if you have to use these, always use a, a, a cable tie around them uh, to make sure they stay tight. So when you're using a, a common mode choke, a simple cardinal rule, all conductors must pass through the core the same number of turns in the same direction. And I had, uh, if you read my article about the solar thing, I had the solar installers come and, and do the work on the roof. Um, and it was really difficult to get the concept to people who don't understand it, that you've got to get all the current conductors through the core in the same number of turns in the same direction. You know, they would think, oh, I'll just wrap three on this one and four on that one, and it'll be close enough. No, this is the cardinal rule. Another thing to understand is inductance increases with the square of the number of turns. That's true for any, any inductor. So two turns on one core is twice as good as one turn on two cores. So what you want to do in general is to get as many turns as you can on the core. Now, there is a point of diminishing returns um, because if you're, if you're worried about a VHF situation, if you were to use, for example, a 2.4 inch core, you might be able to get 20 turns of a smaller cable onto that core. But if you put too many turns on, you start to get capacitive coupling between the turns and that starts to defeat the uh, choking effect of the core. And so if you're in a situation like that, um, then it would be good to get some advice as far as exactly what the best uh, number of turns to use would be on a particular core. And you can get that advice on the web. Um, there's a lot of sources for that. So for differential mode, now we're, we're not talking about common mode anymore. We're talking about differential mode. In this case, the, the current is flowing in opposite directions on the two conductors. And if we put a magnetic core around this, the magnetic field from one conductor is canceled by the magnetic field of the other conductor. So there's no magnetic field entering the core. And so the core has no effect because it doesn't see any magnetic, magnetic field. So in order to make a filter for this kind of noise, we have to use lumped inductors and capacitors. So here's a, a typical circuit for a, a differential mode line filter. And this one also has common mode. So these, these inductors are coupled in such a way that they, they're effective for common mode. But you can see that this one here, this inductor and this capacitor are forming a low pass filter that'll remove noise coming in from the left and shunt it to ground so it doesn't make it to the load. And basically you're filtering both sides of this, of this mess independently. And here are some uh, photographs of typical differential mode filters. This is a typical Corcom 110 volt uh, low current filter. This one here is a, a higher current. Um, and it, this one actually is for three phase. So it has uh, three different uh, lines, a neutral and an earth ground. And then uh, borrowing again from my experience with the solar, uh, basically the, the solar power ends up with a, a central inverter, which is just a, a huge switcher that converts the DC from the solar panels to 60 cycle, 240 volt to be applied to your, uh, your power grid. And so the output of the switcher was very suspect to be noisy. And so I added both a differential filter and this is a, a huge 60 amp differential line filter in the proper uh, boxes. And then also a common mode filter. In, and in this case, I used uh, 30 ferrite beads inside of a, just held together in a piece of PVC pipe to make, uh, make uh, a huge uh, common mode choke. 
And uh, often if you uh, discover that there's an issue, you might uh, find that there's a device uh, in your neighbor's house that's causing trouble. And so most devices are regulated by FCC part 15, uh, not to cause interference and to, they have to accept any interference that may be caused to them. But the issue is that um, the, uh, the operator of the device is the person who's responsible for dealing with, with any uh, RFI issues, any RFI problems. But quite frequently, the operator doesn't want to do it, doesn't have the technical savvy to do it. It's really interesting. Uh, if you read the FCC recommendations, it says, well, if you've got a problem, uh, refer it to your local radio TV technician. Has anybody seen a local radio TV technician these days? Nobody fixes anything. You know, if something breaks, you throw it away uh, and buy a new one. So that's kind of a lame term I, I find humorous. Um, basically, the whole thing about FCC Part 15 is that manufacturers are supposed to test the device and certify that it meets the FCC specifications and then label it. It's not that the FCC actually tests the device. It's up to the, the uh, manufacturer to uh, say that it passes. And so there's a lot of, a lot of room in there for the fact that they may not have tested it properly. Um, and there's also no guarantee that they, they tested it in any specific configuration. You know, if they test a, a wall wart when it's not connected to a particular phone or not delivering a certain load, maybe they haven't covered the case where it's giving you noise. The, the specifications for FCC part 15 are not that tough under 30 megahertz anyway. And then one thing that's really troublesome for solar power is it only applies to line connected devices. So a lot of the issue with solar power is that there are inverters on the roof which are connected to the solar panels and they're connected to the inverter in the, you know, the central inverter but they're not connected to the line. So that's kind of a loophole that uh, lets a lot of the solar power companies out uh, of having to deal with part 15. And uh, this is just uh, a quote about the uh, compliance and has the really funny part about consult the dealer or an experienced radio TV technician for help. Uh, they, those don't exist. And typically the dealers don't know what to do with it. Um, a lot of the solar installers don't have any idea how to deal with RFI. And it's the operator of the part 15 device that's responsible for correcting the interference. And that can cause a lot of confusion. So, you know, basically the manufacturers won't talk about it. They, they try to hide behind proprietary information or intellectual property. Um, I'll give you a hint, you can find out a lot about their devices by just looking up their patents. I've done that. Um, and it's very likely that you're the smartest person in the room when it comes to figuring out how to solve the problem. So in these situations where unfortunately it involves another party, you have to be willing to take the responsibility and you have to find a way to get along with the other party and get their cooperation and try to offer them your advice and your help. So um, I've got a couple of war stories here that I'll talk about and, and then I think we can open it up for questions. Um, we redid our kitchen about eight years ago and we put in a new dishwasher. And I was in my ham shack and it was after dinner, the dishwasher was running. I'm on my radio. And I hear this weird noise. And I kid you not, it sounded like dripping water. It sounded like dripping water. And I tracked it down to the brand new dishwasher. And I ended up, first I, I uh, wrapped the line cord on a, on a 2.4 inch mix 31 core, and that didn't really do anything. 
And that told me that, so I knew it was the dishwasher because I could turn it off and the noise would go away. I turn it back on, the noise comes back. Um, I ended up buying a, uh, a power line filter from Amazon. It was a trip light filter, uh, nice little box, plugs in, has outlets. And using the combination of both that filter and the 2.4 inch common mode core, I quieted down the dishwasher. Uh, another example was we went to uh, the flea market and somebody was selling a, a little electric scooter. And we thought, oh, that'd be a great idea because we go to Disney uh, a lot and it would be a lot of fun to have that scooter to ride around uh, the, uh, the campground at, down at Disney. So we bought the scooter, you know, wasn't very expensive but, and it came with a charger and uh, threw it in the back of the garage and plugged it in to charge. And next thing I know, I'm on my radio and I hear this horrendous racket on the radio. And long story short, it turned out to be the electric bike charger that was a really terribly designed switcher. Uh, another example was a very long time ago, uh, I had a noise on the radio and I went out hunting around with all of the various tools that I have and I located it to the neighbor's house and this neighbor was very cooperative. They let me inside. I walked around and isolated it to a touch lamp. And, and this is a lamp where you turn it on and off by, by touching it. Uh, it had a, a metal ring on the, it was a pole lamp and you touch this ring and it turns it on and off. And it turned out that, that uh, it was sensing capacitance. It was exciting the ring with some kind of uh, uh, AC signal and that harmonics of that signal were getting into the ham radio bands. And I was able to put a filter on that uh, and quiet it down. And that was an example of uh, working well with a neighbor and you know trying to maintain relations uh, and using my expertise to fix it. Uh, another example is uh, the, uh, the DC power supply in my RV. Um, and I've had several RVs and, and they're all the same. Basically, uh, the RV has a, a, a battery for the engine. And then typically they have one or more batteries for the, uh, the coach part. And they have a, a power supply so that when you're plugged in and you're camping somewhere, they have a, a, a basically a battery charger that provides 12 volts to run, to charge the battery and run all of the 12 volt appliances in the RV. And again, it's, it's just a poorly designed switcher and uh, ended up putting some, uh, some cores on the, uh, the DC leads coming out of it. And uh, that fixed it up. Another time, uh, after dinner, I'm getting on the radio, it's dark out, turn on the radio, and there's this 30 over nine power line noise. Nasty, nasty buzz, loudest I've ever heard. So I said, well, that's gotta be easy to find. So I, I went flying out down the driveway in the dark, looked around, one pole down from mine was on fire. Uh, the arc was so bad, that it was on fire. And I called up the power company and they came down real quick. So when, when, they, when they found out that the pole was on fire, they were there in a hurry. So if you, if you really know what pole it is, you might consider mentioning that the pole is smoking, oh, it's on fire now. Well, the fire's gone out when they got there, but anyway, it'll get their attention in a hurry. Um, and then one other thing, of course, we, we did a lot of construction uh, about eight years ago when I retired. And all of the new, we had to put in, uh, upgraded the service from 100 amp to 200 amp, put in a new sub panel. All the new breakers had to be arc fault uh, breakers. And they're awful. They're just terrible. Uh, I had some some circuits that would blow if I was on two meters with 20 watts. 
and other circuits that would blow only when I was on 160 with 500 watts. Um, and I have been mostly successful at dealing with arc fault breakers by adding uh, chokes and stuff. Um, but that's kind of not within the purview of this talk because uh, I don't want to be advising people to add chokes inside their electrical panel. But uh, needless to say that there's a case where the, arc, the interference is going the other way. The ham radio station is interfering with another device. And ultimately, that device needed some better shielding. So um, basically, you know, the, uh, I hope I've given you some ideas for some simple tools that can, you can build and uh, how you can use straightforward and logical diagnosis to try to find the source. Uh, and uh, you can apply some filtering techniques to fix it once you found it. And that persistence and luck are the keys. So that's the end of my uh, formal presentation. And uh, I don't know how to make this work, but uh, I, I can answer questions if there are any. Let me get my microphone on. on uh, okay, we are uh, looking for hands up and we got one question in chat. Uh, Barry, you wanna take the chat? Sure, okay. Tom W3TDH wants to know, can the frequencies which are undesirable be contained by a low pass filter? Uh, so, uh, if you can filter them at the source and the frequency, the cutoff frequency of the low pass filter is below the frequency that you want to operate at, then that could be a, uh, a remediation. Um, or if you're operating and you're interfering with something else, uh, you could use a low pass filter. That may help or may not. It depends on what frequency of energy is is causing the the uh, problem. Okay, and I have one question about what, what would you say about local clubs doing the noise interference committees? I think that's something a lot of the clubs should be doing, and we're trying to do that down here. And I think a lot of the clubs should be doing that. So I think that's a good idea. Um, typically, in a club. There'll be some people who have uh, more knowledge or experience uh, hunting down noise. And if you could enlist their help, that you'll get a lot further with that. The other thing is that uh, clubs can pool their resources to, to build or buy the equipment they need. Uh, and, then, and then they can lend it out as it's needed. So, you know, I own this stuff. I built it and I've kept it for years. But, you know, if, if uh, a club had done that, then it would be available for others to use in a club. Okay. Uh, Dennis, you want to take it? Ah, thank you. And Tony, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much for uh, doing that for Rat Pack and a lot of good information there for folks. Um, I wanted to share with you a couple of things. I, I've been using, of course, going back like you back to the 60s a gonset communicator on two meters with a three element yagi to do uh to find noise sources back in the old days but what i use today which is very effective is i, I got into um, ardf some years ago and i've got an 817 radio that'll do two meters am and i use that with a, the antenna for ardf which is a three element tape measure yagi and it's super lightweight and uh, very effective and very effective for finding uh, faulty, uh, faulty fault problems with the power lines. I use that all the time out here. And uh, it's, it's, it, we have a real serious problem. I was mentioning before the, the uh, session started that I have a real serious problem with our power company here with one of the poles and I'm trying to figure out who to talk to there now to get them out here to do some remediation. Uh, because I've lost my contacts for that. But the other thing, those of us in California, we have a new regulation that we have to deal with, which is kind of fun. Uh, if you're putting in a new air conditioning system, which I just did here in my ham shack, 
It's a, a, the, what they call the mini splits. In the state of California, we're required for energy conservation that they have to use variable speed motors in them. And anytime you use a variable speed motor, motor, it's like a switching power supply. They generate all kinds of racket. So that's what I've been dealing with lately is, is figuring out uh, what to do to get rid of some of that racket. Once I get my power line noise, then I can worry about the air conditioning. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> you've got some good stuff on there. And the, the arc fault interrupt, the arc fault circuit breakers, are, I wasn't really aware of what kind of problems those could generate. So that's, uh, that's interesting. Thank you for uh, sharing that. But so, uh, uh, let me just mention a couple yeah. of things. Um, one other thing that can be used for finding arcing power lines is an acoustic device. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, yes. And I also uh, have a directional microphone that can be used for that. Yes. I, I actually bought uh, a directional microphone that was actually being sold as a, as a kid's toy. Um, oh, yeah. But it had a nice parabolic reflector and an electric microphone on it. Mm -hmm. And the, the really fancy ones that the power company has actually listen at ultrasonic frequencies like right. kilohertz and then mix it down. Uh, right. But they're very directional uh, and you can actually hear the arcing with them. Yes, indeed. Those, those are very effective too. I'd forgotten all about that, but yeah, absolutely. The other thing you mentioned, the shield of the magnetic loop, one of the tools that I have here that I also use with the, the uh, portable receivers is a, I'm trying to remember who it was made by the company, but it's what's used in an EMC, basically EMC labs. Uh, and it's basically a shielded magnetic loop that goes from uh, low kilohertz up into the uh, high, uh, high HF band, like 50 megahertz at top end. So that's another very effective direction finding tool that I have. And uh, those are not, those don't come cheap if you're gonna buy one like that, but that's, a, that's basically a test instrument uh, uh, that would be used by an EMC lab. So that's yeah, a nice piece of gear, but thank you, it's good stuff. Okay, Tom, you got your hand up. Yes, sir. Um, going back to AFCIs, one of the members of our club here, just after the new subdivision on the farmland behind him was finished, walked out on his back porch, keyed his HT, and the whole subdivision went dark. Every single house, <laughs> all of them. He had tripped every AFCI in the subdivision with five watts from a handheld. So don't underestimate, underestimate those monsters. And uh, to top it all off, uh, I'm retired out of being an electrician. There are other remedies that an electrician can use, especially in older homes, like arc fault circuit interrupting receptacles, just like a ground fault circuit interrupting receptacle. And there are certain requirements when you use it that I won't bore you to tears with. Point is, that the ones built into a receptacle are even worse than the ones built into a breaker for strange sensitivities. And you talk about an annoyed neighbor, you cut out their television every night at the same time because you've got a net, uh, you know, <laughs> they're gonna be a little upset. So don't underestimate those monsters. Uh, yeah. the, uh, so the, uh, the league has worked with Eaton and supposedly they came out with a new version that was better, but I'm also hearing that the new versions still have issues, so. Well, the Eaton had to send a, a, a large crew of electricians out the next day. The electricians were ecstatic because it was a Saturday and it was no notice over time. So that's double time pay. Um, no, no notice over time is, is in their contract. So. Something like 20 service trucks showed up and Eaton had air freighted, you know, on the overnight basis, the replacement breakers, which are the ones you're undoubtedly talking about, Tony. And all day long, they're replacing breakers all through the thing. And then the member of our club said, well, here goes the electric acid Kool-Aid test. And he walked out on his back porch and keyed his... Uh, uh, handy talkie attached to a handy talkie amplifier. He really wanted to know this time, you know, am I gonna have an extending nightmare? Well, it was better. Only a fourth of them false tripped. A fourth yeah. of all the brand new ones. So that verifies your suspicion about Eaton, which is the Cutler Hammer parent company that manufactures the, the ones that were problematic in his case.
Um, Barry, how's the uh, chat doing? Got one from Brian in Ottawa. He's isolated RFI to his kitchen refrigerator. If the ferrite choke does not work, how would a line filter device be installed? Um, so uh, you can buy uh, line filter devices, uh, which uh, you basically plug them into the wall and then plug the fridge into them. And uh, they have to, obviously you have to uh, buy one that is uh, uh, rated for the current that you're, that you're gonna, uh, uh, your refrigerator needs to uh, uh, consume. I'm just uh, trying to see if I can find the information on the one that I had, and I can't find it off the top of my head. Uh, I know it was a trip light, and uh, I bought it off of Amazon. And it was actually uh, sold as a surge protector, but it uh, definitely included a line filter. Um, so if you if you search on that, uh, you should be able to find something. And well, I think this might be it. Uh, let, me, uh, let me put this up. I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'm gonna, if I can still share. Uh, where is it? Can you see that? Yes. Okay, so it's just a little box like this and it, and it has, a, has a power plug. And uh, you need to make sure that it says it has a line filter in it. Uh, it's not just a surge protector, but it's actually got a line filter in it. But I bought one that was similar to this. It was a trip light model and it solved the problem. And again, you, you may need both. You know, you may need both that and the ferrite core. Um, one other thing about the refrigerator. Um, I know that our refrigerator is noisy and I use the Sony radio and the little magnetic loop and found that a lot of the noise was coming out of the front panel. So it has a front panel on it where you can set the temperature and what kind of ice cubes you want and uh, how many ounces of water you want, all that kind of crap. And there was a lot of hash coming right out the front panel. And in that case, you know, there may not be a lot you can do about it. How, how fun are you or that front panel? <laughs> okay, uh, any, more, any more questions? We're good in the chat. All right, we're we'll wrapping it up pretty quick here. I just noticed I didn't have my video on. I apologize. Tom has his hand raised. He sure does. Tom, go for it. Um, I I had to work some of these for various employers. I I was working for a subsidiary of Westinghouse installing uh, communication shelters in Argentina and French frigate shoals and places like that. And uh, the uh, some of the adjuncts that we used were strictly, you know, seat of the pants, but one thing on the refrigerators, because some commercial ones have a fluorescent light in the door, where it's a see-through door and they're selling beverages or something. And those can be monsters if they're the high efficiency uh, ballast, because they're, you know, when you're working outside the United States where nobody's gonna force them to shield them, they don't, they can be open frame. Um, so, what we ended up doing was having the refrigerator guy change out the glass to that high E insulating glass. Well, that's got metal in it. And when we use some bonding clips along the edges, uh, the crapola went away until you open the fridge. And then, <laughs> we, and then we provided a grounding braid between the fridge hinge because it was riding on nylon bushings that was insulating the front door of the fridge from the frame of the fridge, which is grounded. Had an accident I had to respond to as a firefighter where that, uh, that uh, connection went bad because of 
the refrigerator was overaged and a person had gone down from opening the refrigerator and then touching the frame gotcha. to get a soda out. And, uh, you know, that's a chest cavity fault and those are invariably fatal, but they were lucky we were out buying groceries and we were one block away and the automatic defibrillator reversed the condition. Uh, but if we hadn't been that close, it would have been goners for them. So you, sometimes you're going to have to get weird. And if you lead, read some of the articles on shielding for electromagnetic pulse, you may pick up some ideas that can be useful for weird situations like that, just to keep the stray energy inside the box instead of outside the box. OK. Uh, Barry, how are we doing in chat? We're all set. A lot of thank yous, a lot of comments. Well, it's been a very, very good presentation. All right. All right. Well, I thank you again very much, Tony. You did a great, great job. Uh, I look forward to getting your uh, PDF from you. We'll get the same posted and on YouTube and all that stuff. So everybody else can enjoy it. All, all right. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's thank a pleasure. You. Thank you for coming. Uh, last call for comments or questions, answers. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for coming. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. 73. And Tom had his hand up again. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tom. I didn't. That was the uh, thumbs up and the clapping symbols, you know, <laughs> to say hooray quietly. <laughs> all right. 73s, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Tony. Good night, all.